Thank you all for coming on this very special occasion for the Australian Writers Guild, 50 years old. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of this land. I'd also like to pay respect to the elders past and present of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other Aboriginal people present. 1962, what a year, lots happened. The Beatles released their very first single, Love Me Do. Nelson Mandela was jailed. The Cuban Missile Crisis had the world on the brink of nuclear, nuclear um, catastrophe. Screen goddess Marilyn Monroe died. Baz Luhrmann was born. The West Side Story won the Academy Award for the Best Picture. The Nine and the Seven Networks were formed out of a whole lot of little stations around the country. Um, there was no feature film industry. After Australia played a, a great role in the pioneering days of motion pictures, basically back in the silent era, it all disappeared. Between 1960 and 1966, there were only about five or six films made. Small ones. I was looking around today, I was trying to find them. Could even find them on Wikipedia, actually. Um, Australian drama on TV? Well, forget it. Um, there was, you know, uh, Mavis Bramston was still two years away. Uh, homicide was still two years away. A year later, in 1963, looking for an answer for what to do with Australian production, the Vincent Report, uh, to the Senate Committee on, quote, the encouragement of Australian productions for television, reported that, quote, this country has already demonstrated it can make world quality films. It goes on to say, the only reason it did not continue to do so is that the industry was left unprotected and squeezed out of business by an overseas industry. It also goes on to say, the rise and fall of the Australian film in industry is a melancholy spectacle for contemplation by all Australians. Much the same could be said about theatre. At the time, it was just seven years after the triumphant success of Ray Lawler's play, Summer of the 17th Doll. Getting Australian plays, new Australian plays on at the theatre these days, uh, things haven't changed. The Guild is still trying to fight that fight, and we do. 1962, the Guild was born. There was something else actually going on in the early 60s too, which none of us knew. A few of us probably did, but there was an engineer's review at Melbourne University and they were putting on lunchtime skits. And little did anyone know that one of the actor, writer, slash engineering students would become our greatest writer, our greatest playwright, the Guild's longest serving president, and also the tallest. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to, it's a great honor to be able to present David Williamson, the Emeritus President of the Australian Writers Guild, to give us our, uh, an address on this very special occasion um, of our 50th birthday. Thank you. Jane, thank you so much. Um, yeah. What happens next? This month marks the beginning of the 50th year of the Australian Writers Guild. 50 years ago, a group of 17 radio writers met at the Australia Hotel and decided to form a guild to represent their professional interests. And the size and strength and the success of the guild 50 years later reflects the importance of the script in our industry and in our society. It's all also a testament to the dedication and commitment of our members, including some of the members of the audience tonight, who have been standing alongside their colleagues, enthralling audiences, and fighting the good fight to make sure Australian audiences continue to hear Australian stories for more than 40 years. One of them, Hugh, Hugh Stuckey, was at the very first meeting ever held in Melbourne almost 50 years ago. Also honoured to have some of the great facilitators of Australian storytelling here tonight, and I'm particularly pleased that Betty Burstall, whose vision in spawning La Mama, gave us a whole new impetus for Australian playwriting. Betty's here tonight too. Um, those writers 50 years ago 
were faced with exciting but unknown frontiers. It was a brave new world where no one knew exactly what the future would look like, but everyone knew that television was taking over from radio and storytelling would never be the same again. Now, why is Australian storytelling important and why do we keep referring to it? Well, my answer was I wrote a play called Emerald City years ago in which one of the characters was a sc screenwriter called Colin and to the best of my memory of my own lines he said we have to have our own stories uh, because, now I've forgotten it now, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because otherwise we will think that real life happens elsewhere and is spoken in accents other than our own. There's a question of national self-esteem about our stories. If we only see American stories, uh, there is a mindset that says, well, that's where life really happens, and we don't want that to, hap to happen because there is so much of importance to us, given to us by our own stories. The medium changed many things. Television changed many things about our, uh, our craft, but not what makes a great story. What drew audiences and kept them um, there was just the same. The method of delivery from radio to television was almost the stuff of science fiction back then, but what audiences wanted to know, what they always want to know in a story is what happens next. That question might also be framed as what happens to us, because on some level, even the most fantastical story is about how we see, we, how we see ourselves as a people, as a culture. Um, once the audience no longer feels it's about them and doesn't care what happens next, we've lost them. And it was ever so. Storytellers have kept or lost audiences from the early days around the campfire for the very same reasons they keep or lose an audience today. So while industry observers, policymakers, lobbyists, interest groups, broadcasters, journalists, producers, academics, etc., scramble to consider what to do about protecting Australian content in the brave new world of digital delivery, multi-platform and on-demand viewing, what we mustn't lose sight of is that at the very heart of all this debate, at the heart of why we even need the debate, is the importance of story. Stories are a means of reflecting, challenging and influencing social and cultural values. The most successful ones don't set out to do that. They're focused on the characters and the story, taking audiences on a journey. From Don Finlayson in number 96 um, in Australia, um, and sorry, in Australia and the English speaking world, he was the first gay TV series character, was much loved and welcome into living rooms nationwide, even though homosexuality was still illegal. And seeing our troops run onto their almost certain death in Gallipoli, evoking nationwide responses ranging from pride to anger and questions about why they were even there in the first place. Um, stories raise these questions about ourselves and our history. Stories both comfort and challenge. Sometimes we see these stories as our stories. Sometimes we see them as the stories of the people around us or of the people we wish we could be or of people we never want to be. These stories help us understand and place ourselves and others in the world. And our stories, Australian stories, does not equate to parochial cliches. They're universal. They don't need to look like our streets or our landscapes to be Australian stories, but they do need to have emanated from an Australian consciousness and perspective on the world. It is Australian perspectives, Australian voices, Australian ways of seeing the world that form the heart of the kind of stories that Australians want to see. Whether we will be able to see our stories into the future is a highly political question. The very reason why taxpayers and policymakers care about and invest in film, theatre and television is at risk of being lost in the proliferation of jargon and the apparent ignorance of history and the frenzied anticipation of new technology. 
It's the, ex the reason is the acceptance of the fact that Australian stories and voices are important to Australians that has driven the government regulation of investment in Australian theatre, film and television screens since inception. It's Australian stories that thousands of people took to the streets to protect when they were under threat during the US free trade agreement negotiations almost a decade ago. It's the stories and not the industry that the policies and investment are there to protect, to ensure Australians see their own unique and involving perspectives and voices. There's an economic argument advanced for local content Creative industries are hubs for economic growth. They generate intellectual property, one of the most lucrative ways of earning dollars internationally in the modern world. And that's a sound argument, but just as important is the sense of belonging, validation and self-esteem that good Australian stories bring to all of us. But Australian stories are not motor vehicle plants. The reasons to protect them extend far beyond the protection of jobs and industry and the communities that surround them. All over the country, industries atrophy as liberalised economic policies mean government no longer protects industries that can't compete with international imports. The economic rationalist argument has power. Why shouldn't market forces decide what fills our screens? The answer is that market forces are fine if there's a level playing field, but there isn't. Australian productions can never and will never be able to compete economically with Hollywood imports. We could, um, without quotas and subsidy, we could easily have a situation in which no Australian stories appear on our screens at all. But we do want our own stories. A recent survey showed that the major reason we want them is so that our entertainment diet won't become overwhelmingly American. In television, the highest rating shows of the world, costing millions of dollars per episode to make, not to mention the marketing and distribution uh, budgets, are sold to Australian broadcasters from as low as 100,000 an hour. The economics of co competing with Hollywood is the same all over the world. In film, the development, production, marketing and merchandising budgets of one or two Hollywood blockbusters alone can outstrip our entire annual government investment in film. And in theatre, a new production already proven overseas or a play long ago established as a crowd pleaser, no matter how innovative the interpretation is, is still a far safer option at the box office. For while in the theatre, the economics of Australian plays at the box office stack up strongly against foreign work, the difference is in the investment in the story itself. Stories for the stage develop and come alive through being workshopped. Through the writer seeing the characters come to life and working with them. Development of the script takes time, it takes money and it takes risks. Risk and far too few Australian works are being given that opportunity. The easier choice is to work with a script that's already been through that process and proven itself at someone else's expense. Subsidy to Australian film, TV and theatre is fundamentally different to subsidy for any other industry. It's not jobs we're protecting, it's our stories and we want to protect our stories. A survey of Australians aged 14 years and over shows that 91% of us believe that it's very important, or quite important, that Australia had a film and television industry that produces local content. That compares with just 1% of the population who state that it's not important at all. It's not just Australia. All countries value, all countries value their own stories and many of them, apparently, much more so than we do. Uh, US films in France are, are taxed to ensure a fund for local production, and government subsidies for local stories are often at a much higher level per capita uh, in other countries than us. 
Yet even among many whose aim is to protect Australian content, there seems to be a growing sense of inevitability about us losing it in this new digital world of fragmented audiences awash with new viewing options. Too often, unfortunately, the go-to solution is providing untied funding to industry organisations and then hoping for the best. But production funding is of little use unless the resulting stories are actually seen. Poor promotion and distribution budgets often see fine Australian movies disappear off our screens in a week or so. The economic rationalists would say, oh, they're just bad films and no one wants to see them. It's patently not true because the sh th those same films gather large audiences when properly promoted for their TV showing. And production funding loses its point uh, if Australian taxpayers' money subsidises American movies made here with token Australian creative content. Investment needs to be linked to a very clear, tangible cultural outcome, to Australian originated ideas, scripts, concepts and intellectual property. This is what's getting squeezed out in the current environment. Senator Conroy, when announcing hundreds of millions of dollars of rebates for the free-to-air networks, which he promoted as a way to protect Australian content and to recognise the importance of the Australian content standards in ensuring audiences have strong levels of Australian programs, chose not to link the rebates to any increased requirement for Australian content. <laughs> Broadcasters have a unique role in preserving our national culture, Senator Conroy said. So he provided literally hundreds of millions of dollars of license fee rebates, which went directly to improve the bottom line of the broadcasters and came with no requirement, absolutely no requirement for the Australian content Conroy purports the funds are protecting. Money given to an organisation within an industry does not ipso facto benefit that industry as a whole. And even if it were to, industry development is not the objective of public intervention in the arts. There are many politicians, for example, in New South Wales who believe right now that the arts should be left to fend for themselves as any industry in the marketplace. In some respects, they're right. If the government investment is not linked in any way to ensuring Australian stories are available to Australian um, uh, public, then creating uh, these stories is just like the car industry. It's all about jobs protection and not story protection. There's no question that both free-to-air television broadcasters, ABC and SBS included, will increasingly um, uh, subscribe, sorry, uh, SBS included will remain for many years to come, the primary window through which we will see Australian stories. There will be other screens of varying sizes reflecting, appending and teasing out those stories for different audiences on different platforms at different times. But despite doomsday predictions every year for the last 10 years that television is dead, it's simply not true. Despite the proliferation of new screens, audiences for television remain solid, as does the broadcaster's profits. What has changed in recent years is the increased free-to-air options as a result of digital multi-channeling. The government has reserved the right to impose minimum Australian content quotas on those new channels, but has so far chosen not to do so. And the result, quite predictably, is that those channels have a dearth of new Australian content. So there has been a watering down of local content across even free-to-air programming and a fall in share of viewers. The proportion of hours of Australian content has fallen across all free-to-air networks from 52% to 38%. On our stages, we have the same gap between the funding and the development and showing of new Australian work. There are eight major performing arts group theatres receiving approximately 21.5 million of state and federal funding. 
according to their annual reports of 2010. And while I've always argued that the greater share of Australian Council funding should be directed towards theatre, those funds should come with a clear mandate for minimum requirements in the development and staging of new Australian work. Australia's flagship theatres should be putting Australian work at the heart of their programming and public funding should be explicitly li linked to that. Likewise, in feature film production, the lion's share of the funding is earmarked for productions which can demonstrate significant Australian content. Again, with the language of intent always focused on Australian stories. But unfortunately, the grey area where discretion about what contributes significant Australian content is getting greyer and greyer. With ideas originated in America, written and developed in America by Americans being brought to Australia for a piece of the producer offset action, a very generous taxpayer funded rebate of 40%, it's a great initiative. But as with stage and television, allocating the funding is not enough. It must be linked carefully to the intended outcome, Australian stories on Australian screens. There are already generous incentives for overseas companies to come to Australia to produce their film and television projects. To boost job creation and industry growth, the 40% 40, 40 rebate for Australian stories is supposed to be very different from that. It's supposed to be special. It's supposed to be about Australian creators, writers, directors, producers and their voices, perspectives, scripts and ideas being given life. It's supposed to be about Australian intellectual property being given the leg up it needs to attract international finance and international distribution. Taking the planks of a Hollywood project and nailing them together and giving them a lick of Australian paint should not be enough. We can do better than that. Across the board, be it small screen, big screen or stage, good intentions are not enough. They can do more harm than good. Careful execution of considered policy, linking the dollars with the cultural outcome and not just an Australian ABN number is what is needed. If we can get that right, if the economic and cultural benefits that flow from investment in our industry for the tiny per capita investment of public funds it receives, then we are halfway there. The current real net cost to the government for the screen industry is $12.68 per capita. And we are one, as I said before, that's one of the lowest investors in public broadcasting in the OECD. There is scope for much more and it is invested, if it's invested wisely, it could go so much further. But money, even if invested wisely and inextricably linked to the Australian stories for which it's intended, is still not enough for our screen industry. The Australian content quotas, which ensure free-to-air broadcasters screen minimum amounts of Australian television, including new drama, children's television and documentary, are the essentials of Australian screen storytelling. Without them, there can be no doubt that Australian television would have no local children's television and only a hint of documentary and drama. The digital multi-channel content proves it, the way that that has not um, appeared at all. And overseas experiences in, Ca in Canada, Britain and New Zealand proves it also. And the commercial broadcaster's aggressive lobbying proves it. Without minimum local content requirements, we will all but lose Australian programs. Local content is not the financially sensible choice for commercial broadcasters. Yet the government must continue to place this onus on them because it is they who have the pri privileged and lucrative access to our TV broadcast licenses. Television for the foreseeable future will be at the heart of content creation and distribution. The other platforms are yet to provide a business model that succeeds as anything other than supplementary or complementary to TV. The commercial broadcasters argue that the logic underpinning their requirement to screen minimum amounts of Australian content is no longer applicable or fair. 
given that the broadcast spectrum is no longer the scarce resource it once was. In the case of children's television, the 7, 9 and 10 networks have lobbied relentlessly over many, many years for their requirement to screen local children's television programs to be scrapped altogether. They were in the press only weeks ago, again arguing that quotas are anach anach anachronistic uh, now that there is a proliferation of quality and accessible content on other platforms such as DVDs, iPads, catch-up websites and digital video recorders. What is disturbing is that the interim report of the Convergence Review seems to be agreeing with them. Uh, this review has looked into the future, imagined a time when television was not dominant, a time when regulating content by quota would not be physically possible, and are suggesting that minimum expenditure requirements are the sensible alternative. But as we've said, money won't cut it. I can't say it strongly enough. We will never have enough to compete with the volume and economics of American imports. The world is changing, but today's policy needs to reflect today's reality. And today, TV remains primary. Other screens are secondary. It's far too soon to give up on the hard-fought quotas and protections we have in place and which are at the heart of why we get the Australian content that we do. Too much is unknown about the future to make dramatic changes based on anticipation of it. And too much is still the same to abandon what has been a bedrock of much of Australian storytelling. We must keep every policy option, every regulatory tool possible open to us. There is time to tread gently and with moderation, and we must, if Craig Emerson's trade negotiators continue to fight for our right to protect our homegrown stories in the current negotiations with the US um, and others, if Simon Crean's cultural policy is true to its name and elevates culture above the industry and insists that investment is not linked to outcomes or ABMs, and if Senator Conroy's review provides guidance on essential in, uh, investments and adjustments to harness the possibilities of convergence without preemptively ravaging the regulations which have served us so well and continue to do so, then I'm hopeful. I'm not sure how many of the audience here are avid watchers of sport or indeed how many lovers of Australian stories are also lovers of Australian sports. Given that we're in Melbourne, probably a lot. I know Jan Sardi here uh, has a reputation as a barracker so fierce that even his closest friend won't go near him at a game. But why speak of sport? Because key sporting moments have been singled out by our government as crucial to Australian culture and experience. And the opportunity to experience those moments must be available to all Australians free and simultaneously. It's considered a shared experience central to our culture and there is legislation in place to ensure we don't lose that. The anti-siphoning scheme was introduced in 1994 to ensure that with the emergence of pay television, Australians could continue to have access to important events on free-to-air television and that these events would not be siphoned away exclusively to pay television, where the communal nature of the experience, which makes it so culturally significant, would be diluted. It's there to ensure that all Australians get free access to sit together at the same time in front of their TV screens all across the country to watch those moments that bring so many people together to hold our breath and cheer and cry. In November, 2010, Minister Conroy released a report reviewing the anti-siphoning scheme in the contemporary digital environment. The report said, the government remains strongly committed to the free availability of sport on free-to-air television. Sport is central in Australian society and the objective of ensuring free public access to events of national importance and cultural significance remains a relevant public policy objective. The review went further and anticipated the possible fragmentation of these culturally significant events as a result of digital media, and it recommended measures to prevent the migration of key sporting events exclusively to new media. 
I think it's our government's role to ensure that Australian stories are given the same protections, the same elevation that Australian sports are given. We invest huge amounts of money in our elite Australian sports people. I think it was calculated we spend many, many millions of dollars to get one Olympic gold medal. Uh, and that Olympic gold medal gives our nation pride, but so does uh, a wonderful Australian film that also works overseas. It's an excellent policy model and one which I hope cultural policy makers will heed. Because Australians and Australian stories deserve it, that's why we should keep uh, this insistence on our Australian experience on our screens um, at the forefront of our campaigning activities. As Catherine Thompson so elegantly captured it several years ago now, she said, if ever there was a need in my lifetime anyway for citizens to be able to expand their imaginations, their empathy to the other, to sit in an audience and worry collectively, to give themselves over to the mystery and to the possibility, the time is now. In terms of changing our society, I long ago came to the conclusion that to paraphrase the poet Jim J.M. Flecker, drama might not change people's souls, but at the very least it will make them glad they have one. It's enough to keep me going. And so we are back to where we started with the question, what happens next? And in answer again, I again choose a quote, this time from Andrew Bavell in this issue of the Storyline Journal you found on your seat this evening. What happens next? There is still the space before me, the stage that as a writer I seek to fill. It's still the space before me, just before the lights rise, when where anything might happen. And we want that space to be filled as much as possible by very good Australian stories. Thank you very much.